Okay. Hang on. Okay. So, good morning and welcome to 2002 CPD webinar series. Um, today's topic is uh, very, very important. Uh, it's uh, cardiology for non cardiologists. We see cardiology problems, arrhythmias, chest pains, anginas every day in our day to day practice. And we have excellent speakers uh, from Dow 2002 batch, Dr. Yawar Saeed who is an assistant professor uh, and cardiologist at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, and Dr. Yawar Saeed, who is a consultant cardiologist uh, in England. So the first presentation today is arrhythmias, cardiac arrhythmias for non-cardiologists, and um, hope Yawar Saeed will make it easy for us to understand non-cardiologists how to investigate and manage arrhythmias. So over to you, Yawar. Uh, thank you, Naseem. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be invited uh, to speak on this uh, um, topic. Um, obviously, I'm now moved on the other side of the pond. So, but but arrhythmias primarily actually remains the same in um, all over. That's what I've seen. I think. Uh, so basically, what I'll do is I'll start with the very basic level. So for uh, the for Naseem and. Uh, uh, Mansoor and Saqib, it may seem a little bit basic, but I'll start from the very basic topic and then I will share. So, so when we uh, obviously start, uh, um, what is an arrhythmia? So I think uh, what is important to realize is that arrhythmias are not only uh, techie and bready arrhythmias, they are on, also arrhythmias with the normal heart rate between 6 and 100 beats uh, per minute. But how I want you guys to look at arrhythmias uh, is not from the perspective of uh, getting a diagnosis straight away when you look at the ECG. So basically, when you look at the arrhythmia, see if it's a tachyarrhythmia, and then uh, um, obviously you have to uh, decide that whether it's a narrow complex or a broad complex. That's the only thing I think uh, which is important and makes you, it's easier for you to then manage the arrhythmia in particular. Same thing goes with bradyarrhythmias actually, not maybe as common as tachyarrhythmias, but bradyarrhythmias if the heart rate is less than 60, what you have to see is if it's a narrow complex and a broad complex. And remember whenever um, there is a broad QRS complex uh, on the ECG in arrhythmias, uh, it means that you have to act quickly and you uh, cannot wait. So start, we start with the tachyarrhythmia. So tachycardia is when you see an ECG, you see if it's a narrow complex tachycardia or a broad complex tachycardia. And then when it's a narrow complex tachycardia, there are usually these five are the differentials. So either it's a, a atrial tachycardia, either it is atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, it's AVNRT, PRT, or it's a sinus tachycardia. So narrow complex tachycardia, heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute, they are either of these five. Okay, and narrow complex tachycardia gives usually gives you time, means that you have time to act, you have time to think about them, you have time to manage them. Okay, now what is this ECG? So, look, so first uh, impression obviously that uh, I want you guys to get when you look at this ECG is that it is a narrow complex tachycardia. Okay, so first this is a narrow complex tachycardia. And then you'll see it is not a regular narrow complex tachycardia, it's an irregular narrow complex tachycardia. And obviously we all know that irregular narrow complex tachycardia, there are very few differentials. Most common is atrial fibrillation, which is this, okay? So atrial fibrillation, uh, you can divide atrial fibrillation into three parts. One obviously is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, means that atrial fibrillation comes and goes, okay? by itself, that is primarily what we meant by paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Persistent atrial fibrillation is the atrial fibrillation that lasts for at least more than 24 hours, and either you have to give the drugs to get the rhythm back to normal, or you have to cardiovert, means electrical cardiovert. And then it can be divided in recent and chronic persistent. And then finally, the permanent atrial fibrillation in which we accept that this patient have atrial fibrillation, and we will not go correct this rhythm back to normal. Okay, so these are the three uh, types of atrial fibrillation. Why it's important? Because progressive atrial fibrillation obviously can be referred for ablation, persistent atrial fibrillation as well, but not so much with permanent atrial fibrillation. Okay, 
and how you manage atrial fibrillation. Important obviously is you have to decide that whether you rate control this or rhythm control it, paroxysmal, if obviously if it's paroxysmal, you go for a rhythm control medication uh, versus resistant in which you go for a rate control strategy primarily, unless the patient is symptomatic. Means if the patient is symptomatic or uh, the atrial fibrillation uh, is uh, quite uh, difficult for the patient in terms of breathlessness, then obviously these patients can also be referred for uh, uh, ablation from electrophysiologist. And finally, the most important thing in atrial fibrillation is anticoagulation. And remember, the anticoagulation uh, risk scoring that we used obviously in UK, which is charts to WASC score. Um, but obviously you have to collect, uh, uh, obviously what you have to do is also correlate the, what their has blood scoring is. What actually I've come to realize since I came back to Pakistan is that this risk scoring is primarily for European patients. We cannot apply this risk scoring, which is just to best scoring for thousand population, which obviously you guys will see as well. So primarily there is no guidelines for Southeast Asian population. So if you look at, so we, we, but we cannot apply this European guidelines when we decide about anticoagulation in Southeast Asian population. Primarily speaking, if uh, the patient has got, um, if the patient is 60 years old and they have atrial fibrillation, that's what my practice usually is in Southeast Asian population that I will anticoagulate despite even if they charge two back the score is one. But obviously for European population, this is the European guidelines, okay? But this again does not apply to Southeast Asian population. Now, how to manage, so one of the very important questions for you guys is that how you will manage atrial fibrillation in sepsis, which obviously you guys see all the time, especially in a theme, I think uh, we'll see it most often. So, <clears throat> It's a very interesting study in Waki et al. There is also a couple of studies which have shown that atrial fibrillation in sepsis survivors are actually associated with the worst long-term outcomes. Why is that? What we have known is that patient uh, with sepsis, if they develop atrial fibrillation, it means that their uh, heart is not in a right state. It means they are starting to develop some form of cardiomyopathy and they are at higher risk of stroke. So what's important is, and also the atrial fibrillation in sepsis survivors, if they have sepsis during uh, an acute episode of infection, they are more common. So um, what you would do in acute situations, treatment of sepsis is the treatment of sepsis induced atrial fibrillation. Don't try to get their rate down to normal because if you do that, you may have hypertension in these patients. So fluids, good fluid management, if obviously they can have fluids, antibiotics, uh, don't try to cardioverge them, don't give them amiodarone, uh, don't try to uh, give them beta blockers because you don't do this if the patient has sinus tachycardia. No? So let's say the patient is having sinus tachycardia and sepsis. Would you rate control it? No. So same thing goes with atrial fibrillation. In acute situations, don't rate, try to rate control atrial fibrillation unless the rates are very fast, obviously. If they're 130, 40 and they're maintaining their blood pressure, probably that's okay. Uh, so you can leave them and uh, uh, do good fluid management. And then once they come out of their sepsis, what you have to make sure is that you anticoagulate them at least for six weeks, okay, when they go out, because these patients are at high risk of a stroke. And also uh, you then refer them on for cardioversion if, uh, if obviously this is the first episode of atrial fibrillation in sepsis, okay? So, um, and then you have to decide that after six weeks, whether they have a tendency to be in atrial fibrillation by doing holters and then decide about further anticoagulation. And um, what I would prefer in sepsis is primarily if you can in the rate, difficult to rate control, uh, difficult to give them, um, uh, means their rate is very high, is just to use rate control drugs. Don't use amiodarone because uh, you end up with uh, um, hypertension and because the cardioverge, and then they can go back into atrial fibrillation as well. Okay, now uh, the, this is, these are the post sepsis management. Remember paroxysmal AF, obviously all of the electrophysiologists now uh, agree that a, um, uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, if they fail one antiarrhythmic should go for ablation procedure. Okay, now what is this? So again, this is 
a narrow complex tachycardia and again you can see that this is regular and obviously um, this is uh, this is ABNRT. So now how you manage regular narrow complex tachycardia in an inpatient situation, you know there are vagal maneuvers, very important uh, to remember is obviously vagal maneuvers sometimes is not successful, but blowing in a syringe, in a closed syringe is probably something which uh, is um, often forgot, patient of, uh, people often forgot that blowing in a syringe forcefully is also a vagal maneuver. And then obviously adenosine in acute situation, especially remember you have to correct electrolyte abnormalities, use beta blockers, all patients with narrow complex tachycardia, you should refer them to, uh, for EB study and ablation. Okay, now what is this? So this is um, again a broad complex tachycardia. So first look at the ECG. A broad complex tachycardia, QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds. So the differential between narrow and broad complex tachycardia is QRS duration. If the QRS duration is more than 120 milliseconds, it's broad complex, otherwise the narrow complex tachycardia. And then in this ECG, you can see AV dissociation as well. So you can see it here, 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 and here. Okay. Now. So broad complex tachycardia, this is the differential. The broad complex tachycardia can be regular or irregular, and they're usually more difficult to um, reach a specific diagnosis. Again, this is another narrow com uh, broad complex tachycardia, QRS duration of more than 120 milliseconds. Uh, but it, you can see this is a typical left bundle branch block uh, picture, which is negative in V1 and positive in V6. So if uh, the QRS duration is broad, more than 120 milliseconds, and the V1 is negative, it is the uh, left bundle branch block, and if the QRS duration uh, is 120 milliseconds or more, and the V1 is positive, is right bundle branch block. Okay, now these are actually the differential diagnosis of a broad complex tachycardia. And basically, your default diagnosis in a, in a broad complex tachycardia should always be that this is VT until it is proven otherwise. Because broad complex tachycardia, you have to act quickly. You don't have time if the patient is hypertensive. So broad complex tachycardia, you're not sure. Uh, default diagnosis is what? You say, oh, this is a VT until you prove me otherwise. Means you have to prove that this is not VT, not the other way around. Traditional teaching of how we are being taught is Look at the broad complex tachycardia and then you have to look for evidence of it, uh, VT. No, so I would go the other way in a broad complex tachycardia because most of the time what happens is the patient will not, the people will not reach a specific diagnosis and it got delayed and unfortunately the patient have consequences of hypertension, especially um, in a ventricular tachycardia. So remember, these are the six main differentials of a broad complex tachycardia and VT is the default diagnosis. What is this? So again, a broad complex tachycardia, again, a narrow broad complex tachycardia, which is very fast. This is actually an example of a broad complex uh, tachycardia, but this is uh, atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, means this is um, a patient with Wolf Parkinson's White syndrome, and his heart rate, as you can see, is more than 300 beats per minute. And obviously, this is not compatible when you have to get this patient out of this rhythm as soon as possible by cardiovascular. So broad complex tachycardia always use um, VT as a default diagnosis, especially if the patient has previous history of myocardial infarction, if there is left ventricular systolic dysfunction, structural heart disease, and even statistically speaking, if the patient has previous MI and systolic dysfunction and have a broad complex tachycardia, you will be right more than 90% of the time if you say it's a VT, even without looking at the, uh, the ECG. And once if you're not, if the patient is stable, then you have time, obviously, to decide with what type of uh, broad complex tachycardia it is. So uh, again, if the patient is hypertensive and signs of shock, you have to cardio the patient, get the patient out of this rhythm. So this is uh, in our Oxford uh, handbook. So you can keep these, these, these are, actually very good um, um, initial management of a broad complex tachycardia, okay? So now this one, so this one, I just put it up as to show you the right bundle branch block. So you can see an RSR pattern. If you look at V1, it's more than 120 milliseconds. You can see an RSR pattern, which is typical right bundle branch block pattern. 
And this is a black bundle branch block pattern. You can see so V1 is negative um, and again is dropped. Okay. Now, so this is the typical bundle branch block rule, RS of QS in V1, absence of Q waves in V6, and the right bundle branch block RSR or SR pattern in V1. So positive in V1, right bundle branch block, negative in V1, uh, left bundle branch block pattern. Okay. So capture beat and fusion beats, again, very rarely seen uh, in VT, unless it's very slow. AV dissociation, difficult to see. Precordial concordance means all leads negative in chest leads, all leads positive in chest leads um, are uh, common in VT. So, but default diagnosis, broad complex tachycardia VT until you prove it otherwise. So that's the only, if, even if you take out this one from today's presentation, that's uh, probably will help you a lot. Okay. So <clears throat> then if the patient is stable, what you can do is then you can do a 12 ADCD. You can ask for cardiology or especially selective like physiology health. You can use vagal maneuvers or give adenosine uh, quickly and then look for initiation and termination of events. And obviously uh, ask for help if you're not sure what to do. Irregular broad complex tachycardia, we know that uh, is AF with bundle branch block, atrial fibrillation with pre excitation and torsat is the three main differential of an irregular broad complex tachycardia. This is an ECG of, uh, again, an irregular broad complex tachycardia uh, with the typical left bundle branch block pattern, and this is AF with left bundle branch block. This is an example of RMT, and you can see it's a torsad deformed. So these are typical um, uh, torsad deformed uh, ECG in this varying axis that you can see. Um, again, this happens in long QT syndromes primarily but can happen in drug-induced long QT as well. So important thing again in this one is to correct electrolytes and metabolic abnormalities. And the same rule applies. If the patient is unstable, you have to cardiovert the patient. Use beta blocker, please do not use amiodarone in these patients because you end up with lots of problems. So irregular broad complex tachycardia, especially do not use amiodarone especially if you're not sure, because if you give amiodarone, you prolong the long QT and you worsen the problem rather than correcting it, you can use beta block. Okay. Bradyarrhythmias, arrhythmias, uh, the arrhythmias that comes is obviously the sinus node disease, AV nodal disease, Benke Beck, Mobitz type one, Mobitz type two, and then uh, finally the complete heart block. So, so this is an ECG. Again, what I want you guys to look at is that this is a narrow complex bradycardia and this is a typical of morbid type one or venti back. Uh, so you can see, say, prolongation of the PR interval or the crowding of the QRS complexes here and then a drop beat. Again, the crowding of the QRS and a drop beat. So narrow complex uh, bradycardia will give you time to act again. But again, here, if you see as well, so this is a ECG of a complete heart block patient. Again, it's narrow. Uh, the rate is about 27 beats a minute. So the rate, if if the rate is 30, then you're worried. And look at V1, so it's broad, okay? If it's a broad, very slow heart rate, then you have to act quickly. Then temporary pacing, permanent pacing is the key here. This ECG again gives you that this is an ST segment elevation and if the patient is in complete heart block, you have to act quickly here. So broadness of the QRS in both narrow uh, complex tachycardia, broad complex tachycardia, Cardia, uh, and also in bradycardia will make you decide about the acuteness of the situation. If it's broad, whether it's bradycardia or tachycardia, you have to act quickly. Narrow, if whether it's bradycardia or tachycardia, you can, you have time to act. And then the key here is hemodynamics. Make sure in the bradycardia, if the patient is hemodynamically stable, you have time to use. And then external passing, if it doesn't work, you, have, you can use AP position. Temporary pacing is the key. And then finally, in bradycardia setting, especially if the patient has birth sinus node and AV nodal disease is permanent pacing. So, so this is so important thing out of this, narrow complex tachycardia, narrow complex bradycardia gives you time. Broad complex tachycardia, broad complex bradycardia gives you have to act very quickly. And this is actually uh, your, um, uh, Again, Oxford Handbook algorithm, how to manage bradycardia quickly. And if you don't, 
if you don't settle out the rhythms quickly, that's what primarily happens. Okay, it will ultimately everything will straighten themselves out in the end. Okay, so it's a quick overview of arrhythmias for uh, for uh, a non cardiologist. I think you guys have uh, learned something uh, today. Thank you very much, uh, Yavar. Very, very good, excellent presentation. Uh, th thanks a lot. Um, so we'll take questions in the end. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Saqib Ghani, who is a consultant cardiologist here in England, and he's going to talk about more of mechanical side of things. So we have we have heard from Yavar about the electrical side of things. Now Saqib is going to uh, teach us a few bits. Uh, and tips about uh, blocked arteries, etc. Yeah, can you can you all see my slides? Are they coming up? Oh yes. Hello, I can't hear you. Can someone confirm if you can see it? Yes, 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 we can see. Yeah. Okay, it's full screen now. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So thank you for inviting me, and uh, again, well done, uh, Nasim and Mansoor for. Uh, Organizing these webinars and well done, Yavar. Uh, fantastic talk. Just just to uh, add something to Yavar's talk, the last complete heart block ECG, Yavar, you can send them to me because uh, he, he needs an intervention. It's not an electrician. <laughs> so anyway, I'm an intervention cardiologist at Darren Valley in Kent. I keep moving around to keep you guys on your toes. Uh, what I'll be talking about today is uh, just a brief overview of acute coronary syndromes and some management of ACS with a few tips and pitfalls for non-cardiologists. I'm wary of the fact that a lot of this is basic and I don't need to go into a lot of basic stuff. So I'm just gonna overview and cover the few relevant topics as I go along. Um, so we know what acute coronary syndrome is. We all know it because 40% uh, of acute medical take is cardiology and half of it is some in, in one way or the other related to acute coronary syndromes. But just to recap, it's a spectrum of disease ranging from unstable angina through to ST elevation MI. And it's uh, and they all have a common underlying pathology with a disrupted atherosclerotic plaque. And if the plaque rupture causes an acute occlusion, it causes ST elevation MI. Otherwise, it gives you what we call a non-ST elevation MI. Um, and the only difference is the if you look at the bottom part of this slide, the ST elevation MI, the plaque is more fibrin rich and causes total occlusion. And in non-ST elevation, it's more platelet rich and causes partial occlusion. Uh, that's uh, uh, very basic. We, we often use this blood test called troponin for diagnosis and management. And what I'm trying to point out here is, yes, it's a very good test. But keep in mind, it's a highly sensitive biomarker and gives you lots of false positives. So always use clinical judgment. And trend of troponin level is more important rather than an isolated value. Now in most centers, we move from standard troponin to highly sensitive troponin. So the values of 0 0.05 are not used anymore. We are now looking at 14 nanogram and then looking at the trend. But if you look at the bottom right of the slide, there are more causes of uh, raised troponin than we think. Uh, so cleaning hill history is the key rather than a blood test. Um, ACS remains the leading cause of death in, in UK and the Western world. Uh, apologies if this bit is coming blank, but on, on my half the screen, I can see it. Anyway, it, 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 re, it it shows that within UK and the Western world, the ACS remains the leading cause of death. However, this slide is now outdated because as of two years ago, dementia is now the leading cause of death because people are living longer. So ischemic heart disease and coronary disease is now the second biggest cause of death uh, worldwide, especially in the Western world. Uh, just, a, just an ECG example. Um, uh, if a patient comes to a GP, goes to uh, hospital or wherever, this is the most common investigation performed for chest pain. A 12 bit ECG. From, from what you'll see, this is a normal ECG. No ischemic changes, no major concerns, but I can tell you that this is an ECG of a patient with severe three vessel disease who's undergoing bypass surgery in a few days. So the take home message here is a normal resting ECG neither rules out angina nor is diagnostic or non diagnostic for coronary artery disease. So normal ECG has no value in management of, of angina. However, it can give you clues of other problems. Uh, or rule out other problems. This example, on the other hand, uh, we all can appreciate, uh, shows T wave inversions and lateral leads, which, in context of chest pain, uh, can be uh, suggestive of ischemic heart disease. And this is a patient who did have non-estivation MI and then later underwent percutaneous coronary intervention. 
Here's another example of, of a patient who presented with chest pain. Uh, you can see he's got ST elevations and inferior and lateral leads. So you may think it's an MI. However, again, clinical history is significant. This is a 21 year old chap with a sharp pleuritic pain after throat infection. This is an ECG of pericarditis. So ECG on its own carries no value. Always treat the patient. And that's always a take home message. And uh, this ECG shows ST elevations and inferior leads with some reciprocal changes. Again, if I put clinical history into contact, the guy is sweaty, clammy, and feeling unwell. He is suffering from an inferior ST elevation MI. Okay, so there are just some basic examples of what ECG might show and how to treat them. So what would you do with these patients? Things have evolved a lot over time. And time is, time is muscle, as we say. Uh, as soon as we identify ST elevation MI, we have to act quickly because every minute is important. You're losing myocardium and every function as time goes by. Now, what are the targets here in UK and the rest of the world? Historical targets, which we use when we were all junior doctors, F1, F2s, people are using thrombolysis. Um, so there was a common door to needle time and all of us were you know, obsessed with 30 minutes of achieving door to needle time. That means from the time they came into a &E to the time you deliver thrombolytic agent, the time delay should be 30 minutes. However, the modern times now uh, in most centers are related to primary PCI, where the call to balloon time should be 150 minutes. Call means when the patient seeks medical attention. Either he presented to any himself or he called the ambulance. That's the call time. Okay. Or the target also says 120 minutes from when thrombolysis would have been delivered. So imagine if you replace this, oops, sorry about this. If you replace this needle with, uh, with, with PCI, then add 120 minutes to it. Door to balloon time, and on the other hand of the bottom half, means that if the patient is arrived at a PCI center, then within from that time to the time you put a wire through the lesion and open up the blockage should be 30 minutes. So it's, it's, it, you have to be very quick. And uh, just to put into context, when you guys refer people to us or they, when they arrive from A&E's or other centers, we often get a call that someone is on our way and we stop what we're doing or try and speed up and finish off what we're doing so that we can pre prepare ourselves for these 30 minutes. Quite exciting times. So things have moved on. These are, uh, it's a busy slide. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. A lot of people are aware of this. Basically you act quickly, refer the patient and only in centers where you cannot deliver uh, state of the art treatment in 120 minutes, then there are some remote centers where you can still thrombolize and then send them uh, to a PCI center. I'll ignore this slide in the, in the sake of interest of time. So in the good old days, what happened for myocardial infarction patients? was this. People used to be told you can't do anything. You have to just lie and rest. Uh, tobacco was not regarded as a causal factor. Um, people were sent on a lazy vacation, you know, a month bed rest of, of nothing at all. And this is literally how you treated pulmonary edema. You know, just, just, just sit them up. But things have changed. Diet has changed, lifestyle has changed, medication has changed. And hence the antiplatelet therapies have also evolved over time. And if you look at this slide, until 1980s, we were not using aspirin. This is the time after we were born, remember? So it's not, it's not too long ago. Then some other drugs came along in 1990s. Clopidogrel only came into uh, practice in 1998 and then became the mainstay of treatment for at least uh, 10 to 20 years. But not until 2000 did we realize that both aspirin and clopidogrel should be given together. And that improves its outcomes, uh, improves outcomes. But then for nine, 10 years, clopidogrel ruled the world and then came new drugs like Prezogrel in 2009, followed by Ticagrelol in 2011. And now in most centers, Ticagrelol has replaced clopidogrel and even Prezogrel uh, in, in management of acute coronary syndrome. Um, why is that? Because you have to maintain a balance between hemostatus and, and bleeding risks. And, and Ticagrelol has shown that it's more effective uh, with, with similar bleeding risks. This is a busy slide. What it shows is that platelet activation involves lots of receptors, but most of the drugs that we use work on P2Y12 and like clopidogrel, presogrel, as well as tacagrel. The difference is that clopidogrel and presogrel have to be metabolized and changed from inactive form to the active form, and then they work on the platelet. However, tacagrelol is already present in the active form. It bypasses the liver metabolism. Hence, it's quicker to bind, rapid in action, and some other drugs may not interfere as much as they do with a, 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 other tablets. So that's the, that's the main benefit that the Kegel has. 
uh, it's much quicker to act. As you can see in this slide, forget about all the information, but if you look at the binding, Cloppy and Presogrel reverse irreversibly bind, so take longer to come out of the body. However, Ticagrel is reversible. Clopidogrel and Presogrel are prodrugs. They have to be metabolized, whereas Ticagrel is an active form. Whereas Clopidogrel used to take two to four hours to build up in the body, Ticagrel takes 30 minutes. And when you stop them, it takes five days to come out of the system. So I think less bleeding problems for a lot of surgeons and other, other people. So hence, it's a no-brainer. Uh, in most centers, Ticagrel has taken over. Uh, and this was proven by a big study uh, called the PLATO trial, which looked at Ticagrel versus Clopidogrel in patients with acute coronary syndrome. And I'm just going to share the two main information here. One, uh, the primary outcome, cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. There was a significant difference between Ticagrel and Clopidogrel group, uh, which was statistically significant. And if you look at the bleeding risks, no major difference. So it's more potent, but not, does not cause major bleeding. One thing to remember, again, for non-cardiologists, Ticagrel can cause dyspnea because it has bradykinin-like action. So it, it does cause dyspnea, but, but it gets better with time. So patients just persevere with it. Uh, I'm going to move on from this one in the interest of time. So we discussed the tablets. I'm only briefly going to discuss percutaneous intervention. Why? Because I'm not here to explain how it's done, why it should be done. But what is it important for you guys to know? Well, very briefly, it evolved over time. In 1850s, Charles Stent was actually a dentist who created a metal scaffolding for teeth alignment. That's where the word stent comes from. I didn't know this until yesterday <laughs> when I was preparing the slides. Um, but I did know that in 1960s, Charles' daughter described the concept of stenting after dilating vessels. It was not until 1970s that balloon angioplasty was used in single vessel disease, it was just a balloon and not until 80s that coronary stents were used. Um, types of stents, I think this, some of this is important to know. Not just stents, type of coronary intervention. In some cases, we used to do what we call now balloon angioplasty, just plain old balloon angioplasty, no stents. However, there were 40% restenosis at six months, a lot of them with symptoms, so they ended up back in hospitals. And at least one in five required, required repeat intervention. So it, it wasn't the best thing. Then came the era of stents with initially bare metal stents, which has metal scaffolding, but no drug coating. Again, at one year, there was 20 to 30% angiographic restenosis, but most of them with, without symptoms. So we knew it's not working, but some people didn't know that. Uh, but one in 10 would require uh, intervention. However, they only needed four weeks of dual entry therapy. To resolve that, we came up with drug loading stents, which are the most widely used technology now. It has a metal scaffolding and what we call anti-proliferated drug coating. And the most common ones are serolimus, paclitaxel, avirulimus, but more and more are coming now. Uh, the benefit is that at one year, there's only 5% angiographic restenosis. However, they'll require slightly longer duration of dual antibiotic therapy to make sure that these, the, the, the uh, metal scaffolding is well endothelized uh, adjacent to the coronary wall. However, some newer form of stents, like Synergy, has now got evidence that even in 6 to 12 weeks of dual antibiotic therapy is enough for them. And plus, even newer forms, like Biofreedom, which are like a hybrid technology, they have joint property of drug eluting stent as well as bare metal. So what happens, this is very clever, but they're very expensive. For the first four weeks, they act like drug eluting stents, but then after that, all the drug is gone and they become bare metal, which basically means you can stop the dual antibiotic therapy or at least put them down to single. Um, finally, what about no stents? Uh, there are some cases where you use, we use drug eluting balloons rather than drug eluting stents itself. So this is a slightly advanced kind of balloon angioplasty where a drug coating is there and it's used uh, in, in certain small branches or certain conditions. However, the, the use is still limited. There are some centers like in Norwich, um, some, some operators use this solely. Uh, I think the use is improving and increasing with time. So some, what I'm going to move on to now is I didn't put too much technical detail into my, my slide because it's, it's, it's become, it becomes irrelevant. Uh, I, I've, I've, I've I've thought of a few slides where I think there may be some useful information for non-cardiologists, the question that we are often asked. Uh, for example, what, what to do for patients before and after PCI? Okay, so we have to make sure that the bloods are fine, the hemoglobin and renal function. We have to make sure that they've been loaded on aspirin and clopidogrel or ticagrel. 
Uh, and this applies to people in hospital or who are coming from home. We have to stop their anticoagulants if there are any, two to three days before procedure. And if they are in hospital, as the acute physicians will know, we sometimes have to hold off their low molecular weight uh, as well on the day of procedure to reduce the risk of bleeding from vascular access. Uh, think of the vascular access, whether it's going to be radial or femoral, do they have peripheral vascular disease? All these things need to be uh, taken into account. And then potential complications. If they're diabetic, we, we hold off metformin for 48 hours per procedure. And if they're renal patients, we give them pre and post hydration and hold off nephrotoxic. So these are the things to watch out for in hospital and even in general practice. Important thing to note here, watch for contrast nephropathy at 72 hours. Patients go home the next day, but if you have loss of contrast, the nephropathy can sometimes develop three days later. So this is something for GPs to remember uh, that the blood test sometimes needs to be checked the week after. And of course, after they've gone home, if they're complaining of some arrhythmias, palpitations, then please don't ignore it. Finally, cardiac rehab is very important post procedure. Make sure patients receive them and complete the course. What else? How long should the tablets be carried on? I mean, this is the question that comes up again and again. You know, in most cases, aspirin is to be given forever. Uh, that's still the practice. In post MI situations, they need dual interpretive therapy for 12 months followed by a single agent. Now that agent can be clopidogrel or in most cases, tacagrel. If they've had PCI with drug eluting stent, then again, 12 months of dual interpretive therapy. However, as I've mentioned before, there are certain stents like synergy drug eluting stents where six weeks is enough or by freedom where four weeks is enough. So seek expert advice because the location and the type of stent matters. If it's a bare metal, then four weeks is enough. But in, forget about what kind of stent was used. If it was post MI, then 12 months applies. Okay. What to do with anticoagulation with antiplatelets? Now this is another scenario, uh, which, which Yavar will also agree that becomes quite a, quite, quite a challenge sometimes. Patients who are requiring anticoagulation for whatever reason, uh, we have to carefully select what to do. In, 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 until recently, aspirin plus clopidogrel plus warfarin was still being used. It still is being used. Uh, there's no harm with it. But we have to take into account what the bleeding risks might be, how long should the course of antibiotics be, as on antibiotics, anticoagulants and antiplatelets. But, and, and, and at the same time, use the stents. You know, we have to plan things. If we use these kind of stents, then we can come off the trip third agent much sooner. But recently from another trial called Pioneer AF trial, there's more evidence that combination of clopidogrel with rivaroxaban can be used with, with, with safety where we do not use aspirin at all. We give clopidogrel 75 milligram with a reduced dose of rivaroxaban, 15 milligrams for 12 months. And once we stop clopidogrel, then we put them back on 20 milligram rivaroxaban. That's another regime which is being used in these kinds of situations that people have AF and they may have high risk of bleeding. One thing worth noting at the end, because I've been asked this question a few times, patients who've gone trans catheter aortic valve implantation, TAVI, or they've got bioprosthetic valves, they don't need anticoagulation. And TAVI patients only need dual integration for four weeks. So there's sometimes a confusion at the GPs or some even acute physicians that they think that this is going to be adapted for longer. But that's not the case. So surgeons, what should they do? Um, I think sir. Patients who are in hospital requiring in-house in cabbage, they often stop clopidogrel or clopidogrel five days before surgery. But if it's an urgent procedure, there's no choice. They have to just get on with it and take the risk of bleeding on board. Just balance out the risks. A routine operations should be deferred until it's safe to stop the tablets. Uh, and then restart tablets where possible. Always inform the patient, always. It's a, it's a, it's a legal issue. Uh, at one end, they have risk of bleeding, but the other end, there is a risk of stent thrombosis. Post-operatively, a lot of patients become anemic. We tend not to transfuse them, but in these patients, I would encourage keeping hemoglobin above 10 or even close to normal because that reduces the strain on the heart and what we call type 2 acute coronary syndrome where they have a small to bone rise post-operatively because of anemia. Uh, so we can avoid that by keeping hemoglobin above a certain range. However, keep in mind, this is another caveat, that the, the blood transfusion reduces the efficacy of antiplatelets. Because imagine a patient who's got some blood in his body, which has got aspirin and clopidogrel on board. If you give him two pints of blood with no drug on board, that increases the risk of stent thrombosis. So we have to always balance it out. Finally, can they drive? This is a question from the patients as well as doctors. Always refer to DVLA guidance. 
depending on what situation. I can't summarize everything in one slide, but basically frangina depends on symptoms. Stop if it's on the wheel, stop if it's at rest. For acute coronary syndromes, previously it used to be four weeks that they couldn't drive for, but now group one, which is normal car, they can drive after one week, as long as successful PCI has taken place and the LV ejection fraction is more than 40% and there's no other intervention planned or no other disqualifying conditions. For group two, it's six weeks. And for elective cases, they can drive after one week if no other conditions apply and group two, uh, six weeks. If it's a diagnostic angiogram only, then they can drive after two weeks, uh, two days. And uh, interestingly, this is not even mentioned in the DVLA guidelines, but this is an arbitrary number that we've come up with to make sure that the leg and arm is okay to drive with, that's all. Um, on that note, I'm going to just summarize uh, what we discussed today that ischemic heart disease still remains one of the leading causes of death. Uh, good clinical history is more important than any investigation. Um, there's been a lot of advancement with drugs, technologies, and we just have to keep ourselves up to date. But please feel free to seek expert advice and I'll refer to guidelines. So thank you very much. And uh, I think we'll open the panel to discussions. Okay, excellent. Very good. Excellent talks, Akit. Thank you. Um, just a couple of points uh, before we move on to questions. Um, those of you who have joined with uh, no names on their uh, Zoom account, like an iPhone or something like that, please can you uh, provide your full names, including your name, either in the chat or to Mansoor directly. Um, and the second thing is, if you want to share a message with the, all of the participants, then you are typing message, please select everyone in just click on the blue tab. So some people are sending messages to me directly. Um, so if you want to message to everyone, then select everyone uh, in the Zoom chat box. So we'll open the um, for questions uh, to uh, Yavar and Sakib. And um, you can unmute yourself or I can unmute you individually uh, uh, if you want to ask questions. I think Amir Gangru has uh, raised hand. So uh, let's for the first question. Thank you, Sarkev. Thank you, Naseem. Thank you, Yawar. Lovely talk and very informative. Question from primary care point of view. I want to know, uh, we are now stopping a lot of aspirins in people who don't have established coronary heart disease and strokes. So are we doing the right thing? And if they have got a risk factors, if like metabolic syndromes, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, should we be still considering aspirin or we should stop them until they have established a, a coronary heart disease or a stroke? So good, good, very relevant question, Amir. Um, I think there's been mixed evidence about aspirin recently. In fact, uh, uh, un until a few months, years ago, we were always recommending giving aspirin for primary prevention. But you're right. Now the evidence is that if they have low risks or no risks, then regardless of age, aspirin is not useful. In fact, aspirin can cause more harms. However, in, in real life, I think if they do have hypercholesterolemia or when one way or the other, they have got evidence of some form of atherosclerotic artery disease, then aspirin definitely is beneficial. So the question can be divided into whether asymptomatic patients should have aspirin, that's for primary prevention. I'll say yes, if they've got diabetes, high cholesterol, and some coronary artery disease, although they're asymptomatic. The other bit is... Uh, what age so, it, 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 sorry, I just have to add something. Amir, for you, your sake, there are two trials which has recently been done, Ascend and Arrive, okay? And these trials are actually done on a low-risk population. So from your point of view, what you have to do is, is to calculate their 10 air risk, cardiovascular risk. Yeah. If they are high risk, if they are high risk, then yes, you have to put them on cholesterol and, uh, and like um, antihyperlipidemics and aspirin. But if they are low risk, then you don't need to put them on aspirin, even if they are diabetic, even if they have high cholesterolemia. Yeah, we, we use Q risk. Yes. Pure risk. Pure risk too. Yeah. Yeah. So if they are low risk population, then they don't need to be on aspirin. But but the evidence is conflicting because we are putting them on uh, statins if their Q risk is above ten. Yes, above statins above. obviously. Statins yeah. there is no but there is no problem. As, with aspirin is aspirin only. So ascend and arrive have both shown 
that Absolutely. low risk population, even if they are diabetic, there is no advantage of no using advantage. aspirin. Um, but statins, yes, definitely. There is no doubt about statin use. But if they are high risk, means their 10 year risk is more than 10%, yeah. then you have to put them on aspirin. Even with the statins, Amir, there's also emerging evidence that we, we, we became obsessed with 80 milligram of you know, atovastatin. Mm -hmm. There's now evidence that if the cholesterol level is within normal range, then yes, they will benefit from being on statin. Mm -hmm. But high dose statin can then cause more problems. So even low yeah. dose is okay. Yeah, so our, our aim is usually to bring their cholesterol down by 50%. Mm -hmm. So whatever okay. that was. Okay, so. so next question we have uh, is from Dr. Sadaf. Sadaf, go ahead. Thanks, uh, Sakib. I'm so glad you touched on that base um, that surgeons do ask this question and dual antiplatelet, how long and how long should it be for? As you mentioned, uh, you should warn the patients about the risk of stent thrombosis. Is that something that uh, changes over a period of time? Say, for instance, if they've had a stent put in six months ago, they're at a high risk of having thrombosis as compared to someone who's had a stent put in a year down the line. So, um, I mean, does it go down? And what is the risk that you would say to the patients? So, uh, yes, you're right. The risk goes down with time. The highest risk of stent thrombosis is actually in the first 24 hours to the first week. So, acute stent thrombosis is more alarming and more dangerous. In the later stages, they can develop restenosis with time rather than thrombosis. But uh, stent thrombosis is, you, you can't put a number to it because it all depends on the length of the stent the width of the stent, the area of the coronary artery where the stent is implanted, whether the blood flow is you know, good in that area or is it sluggish or is it bifurcation. So there's a lot of physics behind that actually. So I think it's case by case. Uh, we normally quote a risk of 1% of strength thrombosis, even for, for our routine cases anyway. So I think 1% over one year is still quoted. But I think stopping antiplatelet for surgery, if it's within the first year, I, I normally always go back and look at the report uh, as to how satisfied the operator was post-procedure. Was the stent well positioned? Was there any complication from it? Was there any residual disease which may have been a problem in future? I think that's what I use uh, to decide whether it's safe to stop. If all the answers are no and people are happy, then I say fine. Even at six months, if you're operating six months, <coughs> the risk of stopping one. Okay. So okay, on that no, note... As Abed, let's go ahead. Sorry, Sata for saying something. So, um, does it mean because you know, with our consenting, we always give a number to the risk of complications. So, does it mean for everyone who's at a stent for ten? No, no, Because no, generally, you know. we would write to the cardiologist and say, "Well, uh, what should we do about the antiplatelets?" But does it mean that we should ask them specifically the risk of stent thrombosis just to put down on the consent form for medical legal purposes? So, I think your uh, your consent, let's say for laparoscopic surgery, should would probably would not require any documentation of what the risk of stent thrombosis might be. But I think if it's within the first 12 months uh, uh -huh. or, or, or if it's, if, if your for medical legal purposes, my, my suggestion would be that if your surgery is changing the plan from the previous cardiac procedure, then by all means, take a cardiologist advice on board. Uh, otherwise, if you stop a tablet and then he becomes problem, it becomes a problem, then at least you've taken advice from someone. So that's a medical legal advice from me that if your surgery is causing a change, bringing a change to the original plan, then always mm -hmm. comes but uh, I wouldn't quote a risk because it's less than one in a thousand probably at one year. Uh, okay. so I wouldn't, probably would not even go into those complications. Yeah. Okay. I've got a question, or is Mars before me? Is Mars got a question? Mars, in the go ahead. Yeah, Mars. Okay. Go ahead. Right. Thank you, Sakib and Yavar. Excellent talk. Uh, my question was actually quite similar to the Sadaf one. So you've almost answered that. Uh, just going to add uh, another small part of that um, question, you know, regarding the anticoagulation and uh, newer agents and uh, and uh, warfarin. Uh, we do take advice from cardiologists at times, uh, but the patient has asked us, you know, when we are stopping uh, temporarily before skin surgeries for skin grafts and more complex stuff about the risk of uh, uh, atrial fibrillation and things like that when we don't know we say low risk do do you have any figures to quote on those uh, sort of uh, lines you know when patients ask us about what are the, what are the risk in stopping for 48 hours or 72 hours prior to the surgery yeah what do you want to take this one yeah so um so for atrial fibrillation now obviously that's the, the one thing that obviously uh, is being asked multiple times 
If the patient um, is in permanent atrial fibrillation and has had good anticoagulation, uh, then stopping warfarin or rivaroxaban or newer anticoagulant agent for two to three days, the risk is minimal. We don't have exact figures, to be honest. There is no exact figures. I don't think there is any studies being done on this. Uh, but if they have anticoagulated well before, then their risk is minimal. But it obviously becomes high risk if their anticoagulation is up and down before uh, the procedure. So let's say somebody has got a warfarin lab which is volatile for uh, um, about uh, six weeks prior to procedure and then you stop it for three, four days and unfortunately they have strokes. So what I always tell people is that whenever you are planning for surgery, make sure and stopping the medication, what you have to make sure is what are their um, anticoagulation data before six weeks before the surgery. If it's well enough, then the risk is very minimal. If it's not good enough, then you obviously your risk then will be higher if you stop it for, let's say, for three, four days. So that's important from um, AS point of view. And I think from, um, from uh, Sakhar's or from PCI point of view, if it's an emergency procedure, then always uh, you have to go ahead and do it. There is always a risk. But obviously, it's an active procedure, and you can delay it after about for 12 months, and you can uh, keep them on single empty platelets. Then it's okay. <coughs> No, thank you very much. Can I just, um, um, I've got two questions actually, one uh, for Yawar and uh, one for Sakim. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of actually, just, you may have alluded to that. Uh, what about the era for digoxin and miodron? So should we just say that uh, digoxin and miodron actually uh, should not be longer used uh, in, in patients? Because I see a lot of elderly patients actually usually on digoxin. So that's for uh, uh, Yawar. And then I'll pose a second question to Sakim once Yawar answers the question about digoxin and miodron. So the reason we don't like digoxin is because the digoxin, let's say somebody is exercising and being on digoxin, digoxin will not provide good rate control uh, when they exercise. And obviously the association of the digoxin, if the patient have got CKD or renal failure, then the digoxin levels can go up and down. So that's why we don't primarily use digoxin. But little old ladies who don't exercise much, just sitting at home, if you, use, if you want to use them for rate control, then yes, but principally speaking, I have very few patients on digoxin. And uh, because obviously elderly patients at high risk for CKD, the digoxin levels can go up and then sure. get caused further havoc. So mm -hmm. I think primarily most of us have discontinued using digoxin for air control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, uh, so I'll keep actually just um, um, starting off from where you've left about um, nephrotoxins and contrast induced nephropathy. Now, just kind of actually wanted to share a very little small detail about a patient who was under the cardiologist with kind of actually CKD, some nephrotoxics on board, as you said, metformin and ACE and ARP. And basically, the patient actually had the angio and um, was discharged without any, you know, using these done post discharge. And usually, contrast induced nephropathy does not usually happen within two or three days. It takes about three or four days for a peak to rise, and then basically it gets better. I yet have to see someone who develops end-stage kidney disease because of contrast. But unfortunately, the patients actually using these were not checked, and then patient was asked to go to the GP to get the bloods done. I mean, this is for you as well. The GP said, well, it's not my problem. They, um, the bloods were done, but then actually the cardiologist should have followed that through. Unfortunately, the patient developed really kind of, um, you know, a severe renal impairment, uh, not end stage, but severe renal impairment when he came to see me in the clinic oh, a month later. That was just a routine nephrology follow up. So as a result, the cardiologists have actually literally tightened their sort of um, loose holes or loose ends and made sure now every patient actually gets, um, you know, post discharge using it and five to seven day discharge using it. It was a huge incident in the hospital I worked with as a consultant nephrology a few years ago. Um, also about statin, you mentioned that you know uh, you you tried to kind of actually reduce the dose of statin. That's very important and relevant because I've seen a patient who came in with rhabdomyolysis. GP started a total statin, 80 milligrams, on a statin naive patient, uh, just kind of actually as primary prevention. Unfortunately, the patient developed rhabdomyolysis with deranged NFTs and was in ICU literally for on filter and had a liver biopsy as well. So yes, I think something about actually a dose statin just ticking the box because someone's got maybe risk factors, um, I think 80 milligrams is, is a high dose in, in, in a naive patient who's never had statins before. Any thoughts? I, I agree. I think um, regarding statins, the way I look at it is a lot of mor morbidity or, you know, prognostic benefit. We think of 10-year outcome, don't we? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. People are now 90 year old. So in a 90 year old, what kind of 10 year outcome are you looking at? So you have to be very realistic. Uh, I, I don't always jump into those conclusions. Okay, everyone should have, you know, 80 milligram or two statin, even if they're 91 year of age. What are you going to achieve in eight years down the line? So be realistic, be patient centric. Always target your treatment to the patient. Think of um, a thin, lean person will is more likely to develop rhabdomyolysis from statins than he is to die from a second MR. So yes, sure. talk about. same uh, as you said, ne nephropathy. Yes, my practice also is. If I've used a high dose contrast, which sometimes happens eventually in complex PCR, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we yes we do give advice to GPs to check it, but we specifically ask the patients to come to our day case unit the five days later for a repeat check mm -hmm. because we know in real life Amir will agree other GPs that GPs are stretched True. and just relying on them to check blood number one is not right uh, ethically because if we have given contrast then we should be checking it True. and two I think we all between us we have to make sure that the patient is well looked after the patients often prefer coming to the day center and having the blood checked rather than going to GP because then it's at least then it's done and we've looked at it ourselves thanks mm -hmm. thank you yeah Yavar uh, if I I may ask just one question uh, for you, and then we finish. Um, you mentioned about sepsis and atrial fibrillation, and if we just 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 go through uh, very briefly. So when so patient is in sepsis and has developed atrial fibrillation, and we have treated sepsis, and atrial fibrillation has resolved, but you said we still anticoagulate for six weeks, and then review them after that, or what if this the atrial fibrillation hasn't resolved after sepsis? We still anticoagulate and review them after six weeks. So what's the kind of path, please? So, so yes, so you treated sepsis, atrial fibrillation resolved. Then in that case, you don't have to anticoagulate. No one. Okay. So you treated sepsis, anticoagulation resolved. You don't have to anticoagulate. But what you have to make sure is that these guys should have a whole cell or an e in about four to six weeks time to meet them. because these patients are at high risk to develop atrial fibrillation in the future but if you have treated sepsis but atrial fibrillation has not resolved okay then obviously yeah. you have to anticoagulate based on their chats to wax score for your sake or chats to score for um, so, so then you have to anticoagulate and then you have to see them after six weeks, see if the, uh, if the atrial fibrillation has resolved, if they haven't resolved, and this is the first episode of atrial fibrillation, then you have to cardio, you have refer these patients on for cardioversion. Um, so, so this is the dif uh, difference. So if it's sepsis and atrial fibrillation has resolved, then yes, you don't need to anticoagulate, but to screen them to make sure they are not developing atrial fibrillation. But if the atrial fibrillation has not resolved, then you have to anticoagulate based on their chat blood. Can I uh, ask Ahad to ask something? Because I just want to see Ahad. For that, or just yeah, for that. I can see. I can see. I'm, I'm asking. asking. I'm, about I'm about to ask. No, I want to Ahad, see yeah. on the big screen. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And uh, uh, great talk, uh, Saqib. I've, uh, I... I joined a bit late, so needless to say, I think Yavar's talk would have been pretty, pretty good. Now, Sakit, what is your practice in regards to CT angiogram? Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not referring here from Australian because there are many dodgy things happening here. They are using verapamil initially as a as an anti-anginal and GTN plus something. The time when I when I used to work, but in which patient would you consider okay. CT angiogram? Okay. And okay. Uh, what are the what what is your practice? I want to know okay. in regards to person with the atypical chest pain, and you want to exclude, especially let's say a forty-five year old female presented so, with a atypical chest pain. CT angiogram is very good to rule out coronary artery disease, not to rule in, and that's 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 the basic principle I use. So if if I'm trying to uh, investigating a low risk younger patient, then I would use a CT coronary angiogram. If they're moderate to high risk, is a diabetic, high cholesterol, hypertension, or, or typical and general symptoms, then you have to think of what your pre test probability is. If you think your pre test probability is high, then CT angiogram is only going to tell you what you know. So there's no point of doing CT coronary angiogram. So that's one case where I would use CT in low risk patients where I'm going to rule out coronary disease. Particularly in patients who 
in whom I can bring the heart rate down as well. Make sure that CT needs to be done with a relatively low heart rate of 60, 65 beats mm -hmm. per minute. So people who are always tachycardic or in AF, the CT coronary angina may not be that useful because of artifacts. Okay, so these are the technical things to keep in mind. And the other situation where CT coronary angina can be useful is in patients who've had bypass surgeries. Because mm -hmm. and you don't have graft details, you spend too much time, put too much contrast, looking for grafts. If you can control the heart rate well, CT angiogram is a very good way of assessing grafts and doing a graft study. So these are the kind of patients where CT can be useful. Okay. But for moderate to high risk, it's, it's of very little value. Yeah, yeah, moderate. So especially if the patients have got, so the chest pains, uh, are, what you have to decide is clinically, is it a typical angina or not? So, so high patient, negative predictive value. Yeah. So if, if yeah, so if the patient is having a typical anginal pain, uh, and uh, every so often yeah. there is no point doing a CT angiogram. No point to do but it because you. A patient is having non-cardiac chest pain, low risk. You don't want uh, to stress their heart. Then they are probably they are very useful. CT. Uh, I'll, I'll add one more one more important thing. Uh, uh, a lot of places only use CT coronary calcium score. Yes, absolutely. Calcium will only be positive if you've got calcific disease. Yes, absolutely. If it's a soft plaque, then it's not. Yet. If you don't have plaque, then it won't show anything. Yes. You can have a zero calcium score with severe stenosis. So in some centers, they've moved on and they don't do CT calcium alone. They do calcium plus angio as default, which I think is a better test. Very good. Excellent. Um, I think... Um, Two excellent talks today. So uh, thank you again, uh, uh, Sakib and Yavar. No, thank you, Nasim. So the next, thank you, everyone. I think it was webinar. Good. Twelve people were here. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Next webinar is on third of March, and we have Mohammad Faisal and uh, Misam from Pakistan uh, on on ENT, and Mohammad Faisal will cover uh, some accident and emergency topics, and we discuss. For April, I think Mansoor and uh, nobody has volunteered yet. Is that right? Uh, Nasim, can I make a suggestion? Mansoor, are you still? Mars uh, is actually for April, but I just need someone to um, co present with Mars. Okay. Amir has some suggestion. Yeah, go can, on. Can we, uh, can we make uh, changes to the timing every time we have a different time rather than same time so many people can join in? because. Sometimes different people are working on, you know, different. I work normally on a Sunday. Today I'm not working. For example, I could join in, but having different times might help other people to learn from it. Uh, Nasim, can you make it post or lunch time? <coughs> because that will allow the Americans to wake up as well. We could do. We could do four, four, four or five p.m. on Sunday. Yes, four to five p.m. on Sunday. Probably we um, in Pakistan Sunday night. Okay, I think if anyone can join, to be honest, it's difficult to... Yeah. Uh, Around 2 o'clock is you not can, a bad option. You cannot, uh, you cannot do it for everyone. But maybe um, we do a different... Sometimes... Yeah, sometimes, so, sometimes uh, so, uh, at, at, so, like, so, I think... Like, um, uh, uh, do you want to go for a 4 p.m. next uh, next month? Or we start from April? Ahad, Ahad might be asleep by then. <laughs> four, four, <laughs> two, two o'clock? Australia, Australia is four hours. Yeah. from there on. Um, but also, we, we need to we need to involve a lot of people from the US and the Middle East as well. So I think we need to think really seriously about the time. Um, yeah. Think about it. Don't make a yeah. decision. I think no, two. different times at different days. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, um, I think Amir's suggestion of 2 p.m. sounds good. 2 p.m. is 6 p.m. in Pakistan, 10 p.m. in Australia, and it's yes. uh, 8 a.m. in America or 9 a.m. So uh, they're all mm -hmm. the sociable hours, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll look into it. Yeah, we will look into it. Mansoor, I yeah, think yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you okay. very much. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank See you all. Bye bye. Allah Thank you. Very good.